Hello and welcome to this workshop and conversation about using staff survey data to help monitor board policies. Uh, this is Michael Healy of the CDS Consulting Co-op, uh, the CBUILD team, uh, leading this presentation along with my awesome colleagues, uh, Carolee Coulter and Helena O'Connor. Let me uh, have Carolee introduce herself. Carolee? Hi. Um I'm Carolyn Coulter. I'm based in Nelson, British Columbia. I've been conducting employee surveys for co-op since uh, 1992, though uh, uh, we've had a lot more surveys in the last several years than in the decade before because more and more co-ops are turning to this tool. Awesome. Thank you, Carolyn. Thanks for being here. And Helena, will you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Helena O'Connor, based in Raleigh, North Carolina. I have been working in human resources, supporting natural foods cooperatives for probably 15 years, and uh, as such have conducted employee surveys in-house. And about mm, uh, a year ago, almost a year ago, I started talking to Carolee about joining her to do um, surveys for um, natural foods stores all along the East Coast and have had some really great experiences doing that. So I'm very excited to be part of this workshop. Great. I'm really so appreciative of both of you joining me for this. I think it's a great topic and can be very helpful for boards and general managers both. Um, what I want to do is first give a quick introduction to uh, what we're going to do today. Um, we're going to break this presentation and conversation up into several chapters. Uh, and as a viewer, listener, you're welcome to pick and choose the different chapters or to go through the whole presentation at once. Um, we're going to give a quick overview of the, the whole system, this concept of accountability and monitoring, uh, so that we can place this staff survey work in a context. Then uh, we're going to give Carolee and Helena a chance to really explain what goes into staff surveys, how they work, what the data can show us. And then we're going to tie that work back together with the idea of monitoring and accountability uh, to bring it full circle before our, before our little presentation is over. Um, throughout, we're going to give you some ideas that you can incorporate into your own work uh, or that you can uh, use to just check and see if, if what's already happening in your co-op makes sense. So first, we're going to do a quick overview of accountability and monitoring. Uh, what does this mean? What does it look like uh, in general before we get into the idea of staff treatment and staff surveys specifically? One of the things that uh, I've found in the past few years is that uh, boards and managers care deeply about uh, staff treatment, uh, about the workplace of the co-op, um, and are looking for ways to, to show, to demonstrate that the workplace is a good workplace. Oftentimes when there's not enough information uh, to, to show, not enough data, boards respond by trying to write more and more detailed policies. And that's a natural inclination, but it, it hasn't really gotten the result that, that the board hoped for. And it turns out that writing more detailed policies isn't necessarily uh, in fact, almost never uh, helpful. Uh, it, it, more cumbersome, detailed policies tend to get harder to monitor, not easier. It gets harder to find the right data to respond. And so we've started trying a different tack, which is, oh, let's think about the kind of data, the kind of information that goes into the monitoring reports, as opposed to really thinking about changing the policy itself. So this this concept that that we can start with a fundamentally sound policy. It doesn't need to be really detailed um, that addresses the overall uh, values around staff treatment and workplace, uh, the environment of the workplace. And then we can give the manager a chance to gather some data, some information that can demonstrate reasonably that we do have a great workplace in our co-op. So this presentation really focuses on the, the kind of data that we're going to be looking at but I want to spend a few minutes giving uh, you all a sense of the kind of policy we're looking at. And I think, Carolee and Helena, this is um, helpful for you all because you're often approaching this from the perspective of um, putting together a staff survey itself. 
Uh, but here now is the, the driver from the board perspective of why that work might matter. And so as you all think about um, explaining your work uh, in a few minutes, maybe you can think about how, to, how your work really ties to the, the, the board concerns or values that get expressed here. What I have here is a, an example uh, of a, a template policy around staff treatment. This comes from our uh, CBuild policy template, um, which is available in the CBuild library. Just so you know, later uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll provide you a couple links to where you can find these resources. Um, the policy, as you see, is really uh, not very long. It's not incredibly detailed, and yet it's written in such a way that the, the response from the manager, the right information, can provide really high level information about what's going on in the co-op. Uh, so we, we drafted this template, again, based on years of experience working with boards and managers around the country, um, and feel like this level of policy really does uh, work pretty well. With the, the policy then comes uh, the kind of report that a manager would give. Typically, Typically, the uh, manager would be reporting on this kind of policy uh, annually. Whether it's done more frequently or less frequently is up to your board at your co-op. But whatever the frequency is, we're still looking with all monitoring reports for some basic ingredients. And the first thing that a manager has to be able to do is think about what does the policy mean? Uh, the, the dilemma that some boards and managers get into is when the board starts to work on trying to create the measurements. What is it that makes something measurable? Um, and what we found is this, this system works really um, much easier for everyone if the manager is actually doing that thinking. How do we create measurement? And that measurement really comes from the beginning place of how does the manager think about it? What, what is this policy talking about? And from that interpretation, then the manager creates, crafts some um, operational definitions, the metrics, the benchmarks that would demonstrate uh, accomplishment. I'd like to say something here, Mike. Yeah, Carol Lee. Um, um, it, it, the interpretation of the policy is what really makes it come alive for us, the survey takers, I mean the survey makers, um, before we can know what questions to choose to put on a survey we need to know the manager's interpretation of the board's policy. So that's a really key point between monitoring and getting the data to find out whether, you know, like, I mean, that's a key point between creating the policy and monitoring compliance of the policy is having the, the manager interpret it. Thanks for, for, for stepping in that there, Kelly. I think that's a, a Good observation. So the interpretation, as Carly says, is a critical beginning place. How, what, is, what does this mean? What are we talking about with this policy? Um, and so if the policy talks about staff being treated fairly, uh, what might that mean within the context of the co-op? From there, then the, the operational definitions come, and, there, and we'll show that uh, in a minute, what kind of definitions might be crafted for a particular kind of policy. And then finally, the, the really the easy part after, after the interpretation and definitions is just gathering the data to show compliance. We really like to encourage the data to be concrete, not just uh, the manager saying, well, I think this is okay, or, or telling a, a, an anecdotal story. Okay. Um, and this is a critical piece of the monitoring um, that managers and boards are finding really valuable, that oh, if we can find something that's objective, something that's actually measurable as opposed to the manager's opinion, it makes the, the whole report much more robust, much more valid. Okay. When, with a survey, you can get uh, the whole staff participating, and this is a, a way for the employees to speak. Often I hear boards say they wish they knew what was going on with employees and they feel like there's some kind of wall between them and the employees and they can't communicate with them. Well, having the board removed from operations is good in that there, you don't have seven or nine people constantly second-guessing what the manager is doing. Uh, but the board does have an interest in knowing that the employees are fairly treated. So with a staff survey, 
they can hear from the whole staff. It's not just individuals. They know that they're not just getting anecdotal evidence. They know that if they run into a staff person, the always says, oh, staff morale was terrible. The manager is such a dictator. Or if they get called in home by an employee complaining about management, well, let's see what all the employees think. So the board doesn't, it doesn't have to guess whether someone's being representative. Um, and they get quantitative data from a survey so they can measure progress over time. And from the employee's point of view, they have a voice and can be heard. If they have issues with the general manager, for example, this is a place where they can speak. And they can speak anonymously and have the protection of anonymity while they, but they can all be heard. So it seems like, Carly, what I'm hearing you say is that the boards often do want to make sure that, that employees aren't silenced, that employees have a voice, and yet we also want to make sure that it's not just one loud complainer that, that drives the conversation, but a way to hear from all employees. And, and so it seems like a key to what you're saying here is a survey as a way to make sure that all employees get to participate in the conversation in a, in a really yes. robust way. And that's why it's so important to design a survey taking process to ensure that all the employees do, in fact, participate. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I'll pick up the thread here. Just as Carolee said, that it's important that, or rather the goal of the survey is to give employees voice. But we want to give them all of them voice. We don't want just, you know, 30% of the most vocal employees to dominate the information that the board gets. And one way to ensure that everybody participates is to make sure that they feel safe doing that and by guaranteeing their own anonymity. So when we think about a survey, you know, I'm sure we've all participated in some good ones and bad ones for our pur purposes, which is to try to uncover what everybody thinks in the organization. We want to have a mechanism in the survey that is going to ensure individuals' anonymity. Then they feel safe. They don't feel like, well, there's going to be any fingers pointed saying, you know, Mary Beth said this, and, oh, you know, that was Jake. He said that. Then people are going to be more forthcoming, and then the board is going to get data that is more dependable. So any actions that are taken, either by management or board, are going to yield the outcome that they want because basically they're – um, their information is more valid, more robust, as both of you all said. So the second thing um, that a good survey should do, and I think that, you know, it, uh, you touched on this, Michael and Carolee, when you were talking about interpretations of policy. You know, the general manager or management has to interpret policy, the board policy, so that it can be measured. So, for example, you know, we we saw one of the common um, requirements that the board policy on staff treatment using policy governance, governance requires is that um, rules that treatment of staff should be always should not be unclear. Well, each co-op, while that may be true across co-ops, management of each co-op may interpret that somewhat differently. In some co-ops. Un making things clear for employees involves putting out a staff newsletter. In another co-op, it may be an all-staff meeting. So any survey that the board uses or requests, well, any survey that the management is going to use to provide feedback on compliance to policy must allow for that customization so that, because it's not one size fits all. Every co-op is going to uh, interpret how they ensure fairness in a different way than um, or how they ensure safety. And a good survey should allow you to customize the questions to fit the, the interpretations of the board policies. Did you want to add anything on that, Carolee? No, that was good. OK. So then the final thing is you have to have a mechanism to ensure full staff participation. And that's a little tricky because um, if we want to ensure anonymity, we can't exactly just say have a list of employee names and whoever's tasked with um, uh, administering the survey within the co-op, if they have a list of names and can attach the survey to each name, 
which, you know, one would think you would have to do to make sure that everybody participates, then you don't have anonymity. So there are mechanisms, mechanisms for doing this in what I would call more sophisticated survey software where you have like a double blind process. And um, in which you can track how many people, if you say have uh, 50 employees who are eligible to take the survey, you can track whether or not 50 surveys have been taken without compromising anonymity. That way you can ensure full staff participation because we say, you know, uh, we don't want the, the vocal minority to dominate uh, the results of the survey. We want everybody's voice to be heard. So there, a good survey should ensure anonymity, allow for some customization, and also have a mechanism that um, will allow the survey administra administrators to follow up and make sure that all 50 have taken, um, but not compromise anonymity in so doing. Well, it just it seems like you're, you're describing some keys. There's a lot of flexibility within there, but there's some good fundamental principles of just surveys in general, whether or not you're designing them or someone else is designing them. Exactly. I mean, those are three things that um, anyone contracting uh, with a, a survey a company or, you know, consultant or whatever should make sure that all these three conditions are satisfied because that will make it a more robust and useful survey um, and yield data that you can uh, feel confident about. Nice. Um, so there's a few other qualities that uh, the two of you felt like were important to share. You want to describe those for us real quick? One thing mm -hmm. that we should be able to do is to compare results with other similar types of organizations. With a survey, as we'll see shortly, um, when you ask people questions, it results in some kind of score, a numerical result. That number in itself doesn't necessarily mean anything in absolute terms. We have to be able to see how typical is it. Here's an example where um, employees are asked uh, three different questions at your co-op. And we see their scores compared to the median of other co-op surveys. Uh, for example, Helen and I have a database of over 130 other co-op surveys, and we compare the results of any one co-op to that. It's not good or bad, but it is interesting to see. In, in this case, we see uh, where we have a uh, staff that's v much more satisfied with their compensation relative to their labor market than we see typically in other co-ops. And we see a situation where the personnel policy manual, uh, the staff uh, rate that about as highly as they do in other co-ops. And then we have the question what to do with a dispute or a grievance about a management decision we see in the sample co-op that is much lower than what you see in other co-ops. And so all this helps to interpret the data. Can, can I add to that? Yeah. Yeah, I, oh. I think it's important to think about, you know, at this that we're dealing with a certain type of organization. A cooperative business model is not the same as a, a private for-profit uh, corporation that, in fact, employees are living in a very different culture where they have different ex expectations. So if you were going to say, um, oh, yeah, you're going to do a survey, you've got scores for your co-op, and that the, group, the organizations that they're going to be uh, compared against are very different in structure, in values, in culture, then the, the relative um, strength of the comparison is diminished. So I just want to highlight the word peer organizations, um, that that uh, makes your, the comparison uh, much more robust because, you know, comparing your co-op, which has, you know, multiple different um, goals, let's say, to, say, a chain grocery store that has, you know, 300 mm, stores in your local area, certainly has some validity, but it's not quite the same. Um, you had something else here, Carol, you wanted to mention? Yeah, I wanted to say that there's qualitative as well as quantitative data that can come out of a survey. 
um, for example, employees can have the opportunity to write free-form comments. Now, it takes some skill in handling that to pass on a summary of comments without revealing identity because often, especially in a smaller workplace where people know each other's characteristic ways of expressing themselves, a comment can be easily traced. But it's possible to summarize comments in a way so that they can back up and illuminate what you see from the quantitative uh, data, the scores. However, it's very important to be presenting these findings in a balanced way. Comments can be extremely colorful and they can grab everyone's attention and they can dominate. Well, it's important to remember that a comment in isolation that uh, doesn't support the scores, uh, you know, that, that may be just one person's opinion who's not really in the mainstream of the rest of the staff. So it's important to present the data in a way where the comments help to illuminate the quantitative results, but don't uh, give a false impression. Yeah, sometimes um, my experience has been that a low score might um, emerge on a given dimension. For example, um, one survey I did on the question, job openings are published so everyone can apply. Well, they got a really low score, and the HR manager was like, I don't know why that could have possibly been. I've posted every single job opening ever since I started. And um, when I interviewed, because that's the qualitative piece to understand why, I realized, you know, I found out from talking to people uh, in my interviews that, in fact, it was, they were posted, but they were posted in such an obscure place that a lot of people were missing them. So it wasn't that they weren't being posted, they were not being posted in a good place. And I think that just from the raw quantitative data, you can't really understand what's going on. So a good survey should combine both quantitative collection of data and a qualitative probe to understand, make sure that what the quant we understand what the quantitative data is saying. Nice. That's a great example. Um, let's see. So we looked at a couple of uh, examples of the comparison kind of data. Um, but now, just real quick, why, why would there be some value in having a third party uh, present the, or or, or produce the survey carried out as opposed to someone doing it in-house? Is there is there a, a, a reason to go one way or the other? Yeah, I'd like to address that since I have done lots of in-house surveys. I think that when employees believe that the data is going to somebody outside, they're more likely to trust that their anonymity is going to be protected because obviously the third-party person doesn't know who each person is, you know. Um, so that person outside the organization has the advantage of being able to come kind of very fresh and open and not know anybody. And I think employees sense that. And so they have a higher level of trust that their identity won't be revealed. I think also when you're in-house, you have sort of expectation based on experience. You have some preconceived ideas about what might be working well and what might be working, might not be working well. And so um, all, all of us have certain biases that can interfere with it interpretation. But when you have a third party who really doesn't know anything much about the organization, they are going to be coming in again with a very fresh perspective and have they are less likely to have bias around that will um, color the interpretation of results. Um, the third reason that uh, we believe using a third party to conduct your survey is useful is that um, people who specialize in doing survey research uh, have developed a professional expertise. They've done many surveys, so they can they know what sort of patterns are like to show. Um, they've had experience dealing with glitches. They, um, you're, you're getting a broad, broad uh, range of, of uh, background doing surveys when you get somebody who's more specialized in that than in-house where maybe they've done one or two, but they don't really, they haven't, they haven't done it in a lot of different places in a lot of different circumstances. And it is precise that, precisely that broad experience that helps with the interpretation of results. 
that uh, you kind of know, um, you've seen patterns so often in the past that you can bring that um, experience and um, more specialization, should I say, to, to the results of the survey. I don't know, Carol, you have anything to add on that? No, I, I just want to say that uh, when people, there's an idea that a survey is something that people can just make up on their own and administer, but uh, one of the most, um, one of the things really to be avoided is having a person create a survey who's then going to be taking it themselves because there's just so much bias that can creep in there. And, you know, none of us thinks we're biased. We all think we're objective, and we really believe that in the moment. But when something affects us a lot, like your workplace, it's pretty difficult for somebody who, with an employee of the co-op, uh, whether it's a human resources manager or a general manager, anybody who has some kind of stake in the outcome, it's pretty difficult not to have some bias creep in. So that's why it's good to have it done from outside. And sometimes board members conduct surveys. But even that can be a problem because board members also do have a uh, they do have some stake in how things are going to turn out. They may already have some idea and they want to see if that's going to be confirmed. And having somebody conduct a survey who has no uh, desire for it to turn out one way or another, but is simply interested to see how the data is going to turn out, that's coming from uh, that's going to automatically come from a more neutral place, and it's going to help the quality of your data. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, because I didn't mention this, in the professional expertise, when you are trained in doing surveys and have done a lot of them, you know which questions, how to write questions that are going to get at um, specific data uh, that w are useful for m monitoring reports. Um, if you, a common mistake is to ask a question that includes several different dimensions and then at the end, you get a, um, a, a result you don't really know. Did it mean that meetings were held regularly, or does it mean that meetings were useful? You know? And so I think um, there isn't a place for recognizing um, expertise in writing questions, not just interpreting results. That's one of the things I think I keep learning the more I hear about surveys is that they're often interesting but only occasionally actually useful and and it really has to go to the to their design um, that what can make them useful so not all surveys are created equal this is the novice in me is awakening to this idea um, we just have a couple more minutes i want to give a, a quick sense of what you all might want to put in surveys or how they might be how those questions might be framed and i wonder if, if just you can give a real quick overview of of how that might look Okay, we'll just say that, um, for example, if you want to find out about the global policy of staff treatment that includes uh, the prohibition against anything unfair, here's some examples of questions you can ask about the fairness of management decisions. And also the, the concept of fairness could include uh, the absence of discrimination on the basis of status and a protected group. So here's some questions that could ask about fairness as in non-discrimination. Here's an example of how a question can be posed with the range of responses that survey takers can choose among. As you can see, each response has a numerical value, and that's what goes into computing an average score. Nice. Um, I wanted to just real quick uh, point out something that I hadn't really thought of before, but in this previous slide you showed um, four different questions that start to get towards the, the, the value around fairness. And, and so there's, that's different than if a board's policy said you know, the, the, the workplace has to be fair or staff have to be treated fairly, you could just ask one question, you know, are you, is your workplace fair? And yet that probably isn't going to give you the same level of, of uh, res response, uh, the same level of insight as asking about fairness from many different directions, which is what I'm seeing here. Mm -hmm. And these are only Part some of the questions that would contribute to an interpretation of fairness. Uh -huh. Nice. Helena, you were going to Oh, and the some? other thing I wanted to add to that is that, you know, if, if a co-op is going to undertake 
um, doing a staff survey, you like to think that it would guide, if there isn't compliance, we would shed some light on what management has to do to get in compliance. And so breaking the question of fairness that you brought up down helps um, give management some direction. Um, they may be there. The supervisor's decisions aren't fair and consistent, but everything else is, is okay. Then we say, well, the intervention might be um, training supervisors to be more consistent. I think that going back to what we were saying about a good survey, the detail in the questions not only provides good data for showing compliance, but then if there isn't compliance, it also can shed light on how um, management could improve. I think you're starting to get into um, who might use the data and what it could show, which is really interesting that different people will use survey data in different ways. And so I think that's a great chance for us to now segue into the third chapter of our conversation, um, which is what we might learn from survey data, who would learn from it, what, they, what you might do with it um, as, as a recipient of this kind of data. Um, so let's take a minute now and get into some of that. Um, so one of the issues with surveys is looking at using them in monitoring reports, and we've been using this word compliance. How does a manager demonstrate compliance with board reports? And I wonder if you can explain, uh, maybe Carolee, why you described uh, compliance or why you define compliance with a, with a score uh, of, say, 3.25. Where does that come from? Well, it would mean that more agreed with the question than disagreed. Uh, so that's where I came up with the number. It is, in some sense, arbitrary. It could have been 3.3. It could have been 3.2. It could have been 3.1. But this, is, this score does allow us to see that clearly more do agree than disagree in answering the question. It, it, there are many co-ops that have scores quite a bit higher than 3.25 on, on the questions which we're using to monitor staff treatment. But there are some that can't make that bar either. So it seemed like it was a bar that was in a reasonable place. I mean, some of this is experiential. Um, here's an example where for the global policy on treat treatment of staff, we're asking two questions about fairness. These are just two of, of some. And we have the general manager's interpretation here that by internal policy and practice, that the uh, making sure that the policies and procedures are clear and treatment is fair. So we've asked two questions about how policies are applied and the fairness of um, how a manager of a manager's decisions, and in both cases here we see that yep we're above the benchmark of 3.25. So yes, the data indicates compliance. So the key, there's a key here of setting a benchmark, and you're suggesting your benchmark is based on your experience uh, from again you doing lots of these surveys and lots of co-ops. And so then once the benchmark is set, then it's pretty easy to demonstrate either compliance or non-compliance. Yes, it's very clear and straightforward. Nice. Now, there is a situation, though, or there's a few questions where we need a different benchmark. And those are questions that are about discrimination or harassment on the basis of status in a protected group. I'm not talking about the kind of discrimination, oh, my manager doesn't like me, or my manager's always harassing me to wear my name tag. We're not talking about that. We're talking about unlawful discrimination or harassment because it's based on a person's race, sex, age, national origin, religion, etc. So uh, here we have to set a higher standard, and we have to set. Uh, we also have to consider the issue of minority versus majority perception. With discrimination, you can have a minority who feels discriminated against and a majority that doesn't get it, that doesn't see that, because they're not walking in the same shoes. So we want to make sure that even having a very high score doesn't mask um, a sense of discrimination by a minority. 
Uh, and so for that reason, we're considering here not just a higher average score than we have for most other questions, but also we bring an issue of standard deviation. Among other things, standard deviation shows the amount of agreement or disagreement with a question. If you were looking at just a sample of a group and not the whole group, standard deviation could also tell you, if it was past a certain point, it would tell you that the results aren't valid or have to be questioned. Since we've got the whole group in the sample here that we're talking about, um, we're not going to be using standard deviation for that purpose. Instead, what we're looking at is what is the degree of agreement or disagreement in how people answered the question about discrimination and harassment. And if we see the standard deviation being higher than 1.0, that would be a red flag, that there could be a minority that is feeling, you know, that they've, they've been feeling either they've been taken the brunt of discrimination themselves or they perceive it for others. And so that means, first of all, that there's more work, more probing and more analysis for uh, for. Uh, for anyone conducting the survey to do to try to find out where that's coming from. But it also indicates that we can't just take a high score on a discrimination or harassment question for granted. We can't just take it at face value. Let's look at an example. So let's say um, and here, here's a board policy actually has something specific about how they may not discriminate on the basis of race, sex, age, et cetera. Now, uh, not all co-ops use this. In some cases, we just consider this part of the general prohibition against unfairness in the global policy. But here's an example of a co-op that actually explicitly, their board explicitly has a policy about discrimination. And here, employees have been asked two questions. And we can see that on both questions, they scored, the average score was above the benchmark of 3.75. I mean, look at that question number 11. Employees are treated fairly regardless of race, religion, color, creed, gender, political affiliation, etc. A high average score, 4.05. However, the standard deviation is 1.11. So, oh, that would indicate that in spite of that high average score, there are some who disagreed or strongly disagreed with that question. And there were enough of them to cause this high standard deviation. And so that indicates that, no, we can't just, the survey alone can't demonstrate management compliance with the policy. Management will have to come up with other data and do further exploration to find out what's going on here. Same thing we see with number 12. We have a high enough score to have passed, to have been above the benchmark for compliance, but the standard deviation is quite high. And this can happen when you get a bunch of people in the department who feel like everything's fine, and then you have a couple people who feel like their religion, their race, their sexual orientation is being dissed by coworkers or by the manager. Uh, and so this can show up uh, through, through the use of standard deviation. And that's why we have set this more complex benchmark for this unique area. Huh. I, I really love the thoughtfulness that went into that. So there, there's oftentimes a manager might uh, ask for a survey to do a survey internally, operationally, to, to help understand uh, what's going on. Um, sometimes other folks might ask for the survey. Uh, a board might ask for one. But then there's the, the data that comes out. And no matter who asked for it, it seems like different people could use the data in different ways. And I'm wondering if one of you could explain um, who might use the, the survey data and how it might get used? I think I could speak to that, Michael. It goes back to kind of customizing the survey that we talked about before and qu selecting questions. If the purpose of the survey is exclusively to monitor uh, compliance with board policy, and we saw an example of board policy that primarily addressed uh, questions of safety, fairness, clarity and, let's say, uh, staff compensation, the questions related to those policy are going to yield data that the board cares very much about. Um, they, on the other hand, if the purpose is to provide broader information to management on how the co-op is functioning operationally, 
there, the survey may yield information that the board doesn't really care about. And also, the board might not have a context for. So, for example, I'll give you, the, you might have some questions on there that talk about cooperation between departments that would uncover an opportunity for management to come up with a better system for transferring product from department to department, or uh, communicating specials between department and a department. Well, that might not be the information that the board wants or needs to concern itself about. So we see that different groups have different interests and different needs and the survey can yield information targeted to those different interests and needs. Um, staff also, you know, have a vested interest in the results. They're curious to see what their peers said about various things in their workplace, but maybe they don't want, you know, most of the time my experience is that they don't want all the minutia. They don't want a 30-page report to go through, but they want to see the highlights. So again, the information that might go directly to staff is going to be targeted to that audience. So um, in a nutshell, uh, surveys, a good survey should be flexible enough to yield information to serve different interests, um, the interests that different groups have in, in the organization. and how that organization functions on different levels. I think I've had heard this question, and my guess is you've heard it too, um, where a director um, wants to see the entire survey. Like you just mentioned why staff may not want to see the whole thing, but a director wants to see the survey and, and feels like maybe there's some secret hidden within the survey. Uh, but what I hear you saying is not that there are secrets hidden within surveys, but just that certain information is more useful to different people depending on what their role is. Is that kind of how you see it? That's yeah, I mean, I, think I see it that way, but I al and I also see that different people in the organization have a, um, a context, you know, for understanding what does a comment mean or what a score means. So it's a matter of kind of quantitatively in the board getting a, a, a data dump of all kinds of dimensions that then really um, are distracting and maybe cloud up the important results that relate to policy compliance. And um, the, qualitatively, it's harder to interpret operational data if you're not there to understand what one comment means. Yeah, I'll say this. Thing. I think it, ultimately we have to keep in mind the board has the has the authority to see data if they if the board as a body asks to see the data, they have a right to see it. Certainly. Uh, but, what it, but an individual board member just on their own or out of curiosity or, the other, you know, they, an individual board member can't ask to see it. But the board has to, as a body, decide, yes, we want to see this data. Well, you know, I guess that probably ties back to some of your initial uh, points about what makes a good survey is that it's anonymous, and so you wouldn't want to jeopardize anonymity by kind of willy-nilly sharing the information in a, in a report or in a survey um, so that the board could make a choice as a group to look at something together and to maintain its confidentiality, but that an individual director probably shouldn't uh, be, be even trying that. Is that, is that kind of... Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. the, the board, if the board wants something, they, they need to ask for it as a body. But if board members sometimes have this feeling that something's being left out or hidden from them because they're getting a report that's just focused on compliance. And what I'd want to say is, well, if you have a good reason that you all want to see more data than you're getting, you as a board have the right to ask for it, but you just got to know, like, what are you going to be doing with it then? What's the purpose? And if the board, discuss, the board discusses it as a group and decides as a group, I would trust in the wisdom of the group that they thought out the ramifications and they decided they wanted this. But I, what I just am saying is individual board members don't get data that the rest of the board doesn't get. Yeah, I guess we handle it carefully because it is so valuable. We don't want to break the trust of the people who are partaking in the, in the survey. 
Uh, so that's right. interesting. Okay, good. Now we're starting to get into how this data does get used in monitoring reports, and this is something that I heard from you earlier, Carolee, about surveys measuring perception, not fact. So can you explain what you mean by that? Ultimately, when you ask people whether they agree or disagree about whether something is fair or whether, or even if you ask them, is the customer service, uh, you know, we provide excellent customer service, some would say, yes, we do, yes, they agree with that, and others might not. It doesn't mean the customer service is excellent per se, but it means this is how the staff sees it. If people, if some people think that something isn't fair, that doesn't mean it's fair or unfair, but it means that's how they see it. You can take a decision all the way to the Supreme Court and get it decided, but that doesn't mean it's fair. It will all depend on where you're coming from to see it that way. It is important to know what people's perceptions are. Perception is incredibly powerful, but we can't just go on that. We do need to rely on objective data as well. And here are some examples that we're mentioning. That when the general manager submits a monitoring report to the board on staff treatment, it's not just going to be based on an employee survey. It will also be based on some factual data. For example, if there's a policy calling for an employee handbook, which the, C, the policy model policy provided in the CDSCC template does, then we have to say, yes, a handbook exists, and it's been reviewed by an outside professional. Um, and do are people familiar with the grievance process? Maybe they aren't, and they need to be educated about that, but one might still exist. Um, and we can say it's fair and thorough because it is based on a cooperative model grievance procedure that's been developed. Um, workers' compensation experience rating will have a lot to say about safety. Uh, how workers perceive safety is important, but we also want actual data on injuries. Um, so these are examples of the kinds of things that with the kind of data that should accompany an employee survey and a monitoring report. And that's a good set of examples of kind of factual objective data versus perceptual data. And that's a great now segue into our fourth uh, chapter here of trying to use staff survey data in monitoring reports. So again, as Carolee just pointed out, where staff survey data is perceptual data. Um, monitoring reports hopefully will include something more than that. So we're going to spend a few minutes just showing some examples of how that works. So here is a quick example um, of, a, of a monitoring report. This uh, language comes from a, a template monitoring report that you can find in the CBUILD library. Um, you'll see uh, relative to what we said earlier, there's um, an interpretation that the manager has made, and in this case, two operational definitions, two things that will be measured uh, on a regular basis where there'll be some objective data uh, to, to show either compliance or non-compliance with the policy. So you'll see that one of the kinds of data is something that is, uh, again, objective in the sense that it's not perceptual, and the other is survey data, the perceptual information. Um, here is an example of how data might be presented about uh, the management training. So in this example, the manager saying one way to demonstrate uh, that we have uh, a fair uh, workplace, um, uh, policies consistently implied in this case, is that managers are actually trained in being managers. And so here's a way to just show that. How many managers do we have, and did they get manager training this year? Showing the data over time uh, also can help managers show progress or, or consistent uh, accomplishment either way. Um, so it's a, a great uh, model for presenting data, not just what we're doing at this moment, but what's happened over time. So there's the kind of data that might uh, relate to management training, and then um, there is the collection of data about uh, the perceptions that come from the, the staff surveys. Uh, so um, here are one, two, three, four, five questions um, that maybe Carolee or Helena had designed to uh, dig at that question of consistent application of policies. And again, you can see the responses to those questions over time.
here then the board um, in looking at that data at that report um, just asks itself a few simple straightforward questions this flowchart uh, decision tree comes from our Seabill library and it's just a step-by-step -step guide to answering questions about a policy report um, so first a board would ask is the definition interpretation reasonable and if so was there enough data and if we go back and look at those previous two slides you'll see that assuming that this data table was filled in of course uh, that that there is pretty adequate data because it relates to the two specific definitions the two metrics that the manager set so when looking at the decision tree first the board would ask themselves was that definition that interpretation were they reasonable then was there enough data and then finally the simple question was the data did it show compliance or accomplishment and that one's usually very very easy to answer because the other two have already been answered so the idea is that the the manager uh, can do a great job of collecting both uh, survey perceptual data and objective data about uh, some other way of measuring accomplishment with the board's policies and that leads us to the final chapter the wrap up here of today's presentation um, what we'd like to leave you with is a sense that um, there is uh, a way to do this that, that the values around staff treatment about workplace matter and that we can find ways to measure uh, how our co-op is doing in those areas so overall the key principles here accountability matters that, that there are ways to create accountability within our cooperatives and not only does it matter it's possible we can do this and I hope that uh, you all who are listening have understood from Carolee and Helena that staff survey data is a really powerful set of data that can help managers not only learn about what's uh, happening operationally that they can use this information to improve their own performance as managers but also they can use this information to report to boards about how they are doing as managers um, is there anything else uh, in, in, in relation to those key principles that you wanted to add real quick I, I just want to say that, that doing employee surveys is some of the most satisfying work I do because so many co-ops do take employee satisfaction so seriously both the management and the board and they really do strive to do something with the data if they don't see that everything's well they really try to act on it and subsequent surveys usually show improvement so and the, the gen, general managers in co-ops generally do quite genuinely care about employee satisfaction and boards do too and, and GMs know they're accountable to boards and now they're very motivated to provide the data to uh, carry out their part of the accountability stream uh, between the board and the general manager so it, it can be very satisfying work to do when you see that it really can make a difference in improving working conditions and making co-ops good places to work and I think that um, just the very fact that this, by conducting a survey, uh, management and the board uh, are asking employee opinions, that is a powerful voice of cooperation, of inclusion. And I think that employees feel very good about offering those opinions and being a part of developing the co-op that they care so much about so this stuff does matter it makes a difference and we hope that you have uh, learned a bit from from this presentation this conversation um, there's still of course more that you can learn if you care to uh, you'll find in our Seabuild library uh, some related files the policy template the report template um, the decision tree uh, and a couple of great articles in Cooperative Grocer that uh, connect to this uh, conversation. And of course, uh, Carolee and Helen and I are always interested in hearing from you and would be glad to talk to you more about this topic if you care to. Um, so please don't hesitate to uh, contact us. So with that in mind, uh, let me thank you for your attention. Um, Helena, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, maybe you can say goodbye to folks. 
Goodbye, and thank you for your interest and your commitment to making monitoring uh, your policies um, effective in the future. So we appreciate your attention. Great. Thanks, Donna. And Carolee. Well, I just want to say thanks to my colleagues to in the C-Build program because I just feel like we've been able to go so make so much progress in between governance and management and making co-ops good workplaces. And I, I just really appreciate the opportunity to contribute to that. Well, I have to say I've learned so much from working with both of you on this project, uh, and I can't wait to share some of what I've learned with the boards and managers that I'm working with. And uh, I'm sure you all get the chance to do the same. Uh, so thank you all so much for being here with me. And I look forward to more conversations in the future. Thanks.